And thank all of our attendees that have joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate y'all being here and hope you're staying safe and warm. We had some crazy weather um, in Lexington today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the mic to you, Emma, and you can get started when you're ready. Okay. So my name is Emma. I'm an ambassador in Girl Scouts and we're gonna get started now. Okay. So this is for both of you guys, this question. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, Katie, do you want to start? You want me to start? How do you want to? You, you go right for it. Okay. All right. Well, my name is Elle Morris. Um, I have been in the uh, packaging and design industry for <clears throat> probably twice as long as most of you guys have been alive. Um, I, uh, am currently the chief marketing officer at Old Learning Brand Family. Um, I am married. I have two teenage children, one 17 and one 14. And I am very lucky to love what I do and to really enjoy the people that I work with. Um, just to give you a little overview of what our company does. Our company is actually over 100 years old. Um, it is family owned. And in full transparency, um, Katie is the fourth generation of the family that owns it. Um, it is very unique because we... Um, we're really a purpose-driven company. Uh, the culture here is putting people first. And um, I know that may not, that may sound different or strange to you that I'm pointing that out. Um, I'm pointing it out because when I was your age, that was the norm. That was the standard of how most companies operated. Um, over the period of my career, over 30 years, that has definitely changed. Um, I'm sure all of you know people that have been laid off because a company needed to make its numbers. Um, it used to be that that wasn't the case. It used to be that you know companies were really loyal to their employees and only let them go either for performance issues or if there was a huge loss that they couldn't overcome. Um, our society has changed and business principles have changed. And so there are a lot of companies that operate, they manage via their spreadsheet, their headcount. So if they're not doing well one quarter, their reaction is to let people go. Um, I'm a bit old school. <laughs> um, so when I met um, the Olbertings and I met them socially first, um, I was a bit enamored, quite honestly, with the fact that they put people first, they put their relationships with their clients first, and they're a very values-based organization. And you can feel that when you walk in the door. So my responsibility is really, um, I'm here to make sure that the world knows about Oberding Brand Family, because they're kind of a well-kept secret here um, in Cincinnati, even though we have locations and um, six different cities across the country and really to develop a marketing plan and get the message out so um, people know we're here and the services that we provide. Katie? Hi, I'm Katie Levy. As Elle has mentioned, I am part of the fourth generation at Olbering Brand Family. So I'm very proud to be part of that fourth generation. And I'm very excited with Elle joining our company because now we get to work together and really make sure that everyone knows about Olbering and hears about our values and really everything that makes us special. Um, I am also married. I do not have any kids though, but I, for work focus on what we call client experience. So what that is, is it's ensuring that our employees feel as valued as our clients do. So it's really making sure that we put a focus on each individual aspect that they might touch, whether that's their welcome basket on their first day, or that's how our social media plays out, 
or how the building looks. So I have a lot of different aspects to my job, but it's honestly the best thing and makes me very happy every day. That's awesome. <laughs> So how do you guys balance your work life and your personal life? Because I know you guys said you're both married and Elle, you have kids. So how yeah. do you guys do that? <laughs> so that is a very fair question. Um, I waited. Um, so I'm old. Let's just get that out of the way here. Um, I waited until I was 37 to have my first child. So I was one of those... Um, women that grew up in, I was a kid in the 70s, a teenager in the 80s, um, went to college in the early 90s. And it was different for women back then. Like most of my friends, like our moms stayed home. There wasn't, um, there were a lot of women in the workforce. And we, my generation, Gen Xers, older Gen Xers were not encouraged as girls to grow up and aspire to have a career. Um, I'm lucky. My dad was very progressive in the way he thought. And so he, back in the 1970s, which I know is a really hard stretch for you guys, you're going to have to Google that, but there was like hippies and it was a pretty cool time to grow up. Um, my dad literally said to me, you can do anything a man can do, if not 10 times better which was a pretty big deal back then because fathers did not tell their daughters that. So I grew up knew, knowing that I aspired, <laughs> I aspired to be a businessman um, because there were no business women back then. And then when I was in high school, and again, you guys will have to Google this. Maybe, you know, the updated version of this show, but the old version is much better dynasty. Um, the character Alexis Carrington was like the first female executive that we ever, my age group ever saw on TV. So, um, female executives were very glamorous and very powerful and they didn't really get into the nitty gritty of, um, what real life was like with deciding to be married and have kids. So as I said, I got, I had my kids when I started when I was 37. So my career, I had it in my mind that my career had to be very well established before I stepped out to have kids. Because at that point in time, the business culture, basically, once you had a child uh, in, and you were a working woman, that's where your career kind of stopped. Um, because the philosophy that was out there was women, once they have children, they don't, they, they, they can't handle more and they're not going to grow in the workplace. So I was determined that was not going to happen to me. And I waited until I was 37. And then three days after my 40th birthday, I had my son. So that being said, I got to the position in um, my career where I was a vice president at, you know, a larger global company, and I was tasked with building offices in Singapore, which is basically 32 hours by plane <laughs> um, from the United States. And I started spending 20 weeks a year in Singapore, and I had two small children at home. What saved me, quite frankly, um, my husband is a courier for FedEx. So his job and career, very different than mine. He's always been like, yeah, I really wouldn't want your career. I like to drop off the packages, park my truck. And when I get home, I'm home. I don't have to think about anything else. Whereas I'm the opposite. I love going home and like Googling stuff and doing some work. Um, but we had, we found um, someone to help us take care of the kids. And she basically has become part of our family. Um, she's been with us since Mia was born. So that is like 17 years now. And she still helps us, even though my kids are teenagers. My son has autism. Um, so he has special needs and special doctor's appointments. And I you know, our joke is, is that she's my wife because without her, 
I would not, there's no way I could have the career that I have. So um, that's how I balance things. Um, so I'm very lucky to have Lee Jean, that is her name, as um, basically my wife, for lack of a better term. Katie? I don't have any kids, so I really have no responsibilities for anyone but myself and my husband. You know, we take care of each other, so we don't have any pets or anything like that. Um, but what we do, he, my husband works at the same company, so it can be really easy for us to talk about work all the time. So we've had to make it kind of a, um, a line in our relationship that we, at a certain time, no more work talk. We have to focus on our life outside of work and our marriage and really make sure that we are investing in all aspects of our life. So I do my best after five o'clock to <laughs> turn off any work talk and on the weekends, um, do my best as well there to really keep it focused. Otherwise, it's very easy to get um, excited and engaged in all of the fun projects that are going on. So while your mind might be thinking of it a lot, um, it's important to make sure you have that rest and relaxation time. So I'm gonna add this just for perspective, like most of you are Gen Z, model your behavior after Katie. I am learning from Katie because my Gen X behavior is not healthy. Um, so again, my daughter being Gen Z, I know you guys are a lot, um, you're a lot better and more insightful about what you need to be happy personally and balancing that in your life. So learn from Katie. Don't learn from me. Yeah. So staying on the balancing your life, how do you guys fit self-care into your daily or weekly routines. Katie, do you want to go ahead with that first? Yeah, sure. So I actually have an app on my phone called Habit, and I use that as a way to track my self-care. So what I do is I have a goal for myself every every week, five days a week. I need to make sure that I'm reading for at least 30 minutes because I found that that's a really good way for me personally to unwind and have that relaxation. I make sure that I'm moving my body in some kind of way, whether that's going for a walk or yoga or something like that, at least four days a week. Um, and then just keeping up with water. I think water is like a big, a big aspect of self-care. That's an easy thing to add to your daily um, routine and just drink a lot of water. So I have to track mine because sometimes it's difficult to reach for that water when I want to reach for the coffee. So having that kind of system in place makes it a little bit like a game and something that I want to complete and check off every day. But self-care is very, very important and just making sure that you're taking care of yourself because if you um, are not focusing on being the best that you can be that day, then you might not be delivering the best work. So it's very important to put yourself first and take care of yourself and then you're able to be your best version that day. Yeah, so now you guys see why I'm learning from her. Um, I do not do any of those things. I am, not to say that I don't do self-care, but I'm not certainly as diligent as um, Katie is, and I should be, because um, I can tell you, being older, self-care is very important. It's easy when you're young, to kind of um, get buried in your work and become a bit of a workaholic and kind of, and then as a woman, as you move on in your life, you know, be it you get married, have a partner and then have children, um, we tend to put ourselves last um, because, you know, we wanna make sure our kids are taken care of, we wanna make sure our partner is taken care of, our home is taken care of, and that leaves little or no time for us. Um, and I have had to learn the really hard way um, to Katie's point. Like I've had some pretty serious health episodes during my life simply because I was such a workaholic that I didn't practice self-care. So now at the 
ripe old age of 54, you know, I am making sure that I drink my water every day. Um, I'm getting to the gym three times a week. These are habits that I should have instituted years ago. And I didn't because I thought they were, I don't know, in my perception then it, it was a little bit selfish. Well, now I know it's like when you're on the plane and they say, if the oxygen fails and the mask drops down, put your mask on first, and then you can put masks on the people around you. That's what we have to do. As women, you have to take care of yourself and be your best self. And that's the only way you're going to be able to give the best that you are to you, your family, to your friends, and to your uh, employer. Yeah, totally agree with all of that. <laughs> I've been trying to drink more water myself. Good. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to move routes a little bit. How did you pick the position you're in? Like, how did you choose your career path out of everything? Um, okay. So you guys are probably going to, it's kind of a funny story. So I went to a small all women's college in New England and my mother was, this was like in 1990, my mother was adamant that she was very upset that I went to an all women's college because I would never find a nice boy to marry um, by attending an all women's college. And then she insisted, she wanted me to get a major in education so I could be a school teacher. Now, knowing myself, there is no part of me that has the patience or grace to be a school teacher. In my mom's mind, that was a great profession for a young woman because once I got married and had children and my children were school-aged, I could um, teach and then have summers off with kids, which, you know, is lovely, but that's not, um, that's not in my DNA. Um, I had planned on going to law school, so my major, and try not to laugh at this, I have a major in 19th century romantic English literature and a double minor in Baroque Spanish poetry and theology, which have nothing to do with law, marketing, any of the above. But what it did enable me to do is I'm a critical thinker and I know how to write really well. And those are skills that you are going to need throughout life. That being said, I went to law school for a year. Um, while I was in law school, while I enjoyed the debate aspect of it, I did not enjoy, um, I don't know, it was kind of dry for me. And I knew I needed something more creative. So I went home and informed my parents that I was no longer gonna go to law school and I was gonna figure out my life. To which my dad said, um, the minute you stop going to law school, you're gonna start paying us $600 a month in rent and you have to play by our rules while you live here. Well, in 1991, $600 a month in rent was pretty steep to live in your parents' house and have to pay, play by their rules. So I found a job at a design firm as a receptionist. And I was there for, I think, two weeks. And I knew that I was in love with this, being around creative people and ideating with them and just kind of the pulse and the excitement and um, seeing people basically get a piece of paper which told them, hey, you know, you need to come up with a new concept for um, a Nerf gun. And these folks would come up with new ideas on how to approach a package, a new structure for a Nerf toy. And I was like, it doesn't get any better than this. So that's how I decided that I wanted to be in the design and creative industry. And I've fortunately been able to navigate that um, for 30 years of my career. And I'm extremely happy. Um, and that's the other thing I'll, I'll tell you all. I think um, if there's one piece of advice I could give you, do what you love because you will never be looking at your watch at work. You will never be saying, I can't wait to get out of here. Um, it is so important because we spend so much of our lives at the workplace um, that you work somewhere where you like, respect, and trust the people and that you all love what you do. And if you can find that place, then you're gonna be a pretty happy person. 
Yes, ditto to that last part. Definitely focus on doing what you love. So I started um, pretty much when I was as young as I can remember, I wanted to be a teacher. So I focused all throughout high school um, on tutoring kids with disabilities. So I focused with kids who had autism or any learning disabilities like ADHD. So I tutored them in different school subjects such as you know reading, math, um, and those basic life skills that they might need to have as they continue to grow and get older. So when I got to my first year of college, I was in my teaching classes. Something just wasn't sitting right with me. It didn't feel like it was the right spot for me. So I ended up switching my major to business and I went into financial planning. Um, Elle knows me very, very well now. Financial planning is not for me. Um, I learned that very quickly. So similar to what Elle was saying, I was needing that creative outlet. And that's something that I was definitely looking for. So the perfect mix for me and where I ultimately ended up landing was within marketing. From there, I kind of went on after graduation to help with a startup, um, somewhat startup company and work on their public relations team, kind of help them input their items onto their website, work on their SEO, and really help them get published in different magazines like Cosmopolitan, Marie Claire, all of those fun magazines that you might be familiar with. And that moved me into my marketing career, focusing on social media and project management. And then when I decided to join my family company, about two years in, after graduation, I was able to have the opportunity to take on the client experience role and really focus on that employee engagement aspect, which was so important to me. So it's been definitely a journey of figuring out what I've liked and what doesn't feel right, but I've landed in a place where I do genuinely love what I do and having all the different aspects is very important. So even if it takes you a little while to get there, everyone's path is very, very different. Some people take 10, 20, 30 years to figure it out. So everyone's everyone's different. So keep going down the path and you'll know when you find what you love. Yep, you will. It's awesome that you can have so many different paths for like the same thing. So how has your field changed in the last five years? Um, <laughs> a lot. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, when I started my career, that is just when Max started to take over our industry. So just when I was like a baby in this industry, people were still designing via hand, like sketching things, creating typography out of their own hand. Um, things were done manually. And then uh, within six months of my career starting, the Max came in and then everything transferred to the computer. So that was like the first big, huge change in the industry. Once the the computer age took over. And now that it is so, you know, we're getting into AI and there is the internet and we have access, I'd say the past five years, the biggest change is number one, clients expect things with more speed. So even though they expect a high level of creativity, they want it fast and they also want it cheaper than they ever wanted it before. That being said, there's different competition because of the internet and because of um, people's ability internationally to access computers and computer software. It has really turned into an open market as far as um, design and pre-press are concerned. Like, to be honest, we have competitors that will ship files over to India overnight um, to have them executed. And the folks in India are making two or three dollars a day, which is considered a middle class income there versus, you know, what we do here. Now, the difference is, is that, you know, when you're working on North American brands, brands that Americans are going to 
pick up, read the package, read the label. Um, it's important that you have excellent quality control because if there's a typo in the ingredients, if there's a typo in the uh, net weight, if there's a typo in the UPC, any of those things, can you imagine having to go to the manufacturer and having all the bottles of Pantene pulled off shelves nationally because something got printed incorrectly? Um, that has that has happened. Um, and so that's kind of the difference as I see right now, we have more of a globally competitive market and clients putting pressure on, you know, kind of how can we get this done cheaply? Now, that being said, there are clients that have learned uh, the hard way and they really appreciate the attention to quality and the relationships that they're able to have with organizations like ours because we're not transactionally based. Like, it's not like you just come in and give us a project and we do it and we say, thanks, bye. We're here to build long-term relationships with our clients and make sure that they're successful in their careers. So as a result, we pay a lot of attention to the quality of our work. We pay a lot of attention to the needs of our clients and they give us more business because they know that we're reliable and we're not going to let them down. We're going to help them build their careers. So I would say that's how the industry has changed the most in the past five years. Katie, what do you think? From my perspective, just, um, I haven't even been out of college for five <laughs> years yet. So I have, um, a little different viewpoint on it. I would say that the biggest shift that I have personally seen is the move from like brick and mortar stores to everything being online. Yep. Just my point being so small over the last five years, that's kind of been my main area of focus. So the increased use of social media has been extremely prevalent. The, the desire to try something new for companies, they're experimenting on different social media platforms that they wouldn't have even thought about five years ago. Um, so I think that that is definitely a big change and it's shaping not only how they're interacting online, but how their products are interacting as well. Cause we're seeing a big shift onto like what's called the digital shelf. So instead of seeing those packages in the aisles of target, when you're walking down, you have, you see that exact package, but you see it online and it's not a photograph anymore. It's a digital rendering. So it's all made on the computer. So, those two shifts have been increasing tremendously over the past five years, and I don't see them slowing down anytime soon. That is a really big change. And what are some obstacles you face? I know that could be a big one, starting without as much technology, then having to transition. But what are some other obstacles that you have to face? I think keeping up with, like, as Katie had said, you know, when COVID happened, COVID shook everything up. So while our industry was progressing towards digital, it certainly was not at the pace that it needed to be with COVID. Like with COVID, it was almost overnight. Everybody had to figure out how um, they were going to, you know, allow their consumers to shop online and delivery systems, et cetera. And building on Katie's point, you know, what you're seeing online is no longer photographs of packages, they are renderings. That being said, the game keeps getting upped. Um, so if you go on Amazon and you're shopping, you know, you guys will notice sometimes there's a store within a store. Sometimes they have video of the product and usage. And oftentimes that's not even, it, it again, it is digitally created. It's not like, you know, someone sitting there and filming product usage. So um, the pace of which uh, we are expected to deliver very lifelike digital renderings um, is increasing. And then also social media, you know, keeping up on the different platforms, our clients, you know, Hershey is on, like so many people are on Instagram, right? And so they want 
digital content for Instagram. So they're looking to firms like ours, like, okay, create the image, but you know, I want a Valentine's day, you know, 25 second thing. Can you come up with something? So it's really asking, and it's great for us because as creative partners, you know, we get to build muscle that we haven't had, but again, it's the industry is changing at a much more rapid pace than it did you know, when I, I would say from 1992 to, I would say to like 2014, things were kind of, you know, I mean, yes, it was rapid, but not like this. Once the internet and um, global players came into play and then COVID reset the whole game. So that's what I'm seeing is keeping up with social media, understanding who, where your consumers are and developing relevant content for them. Katie. I would agree. I would say that it's really hard on the social media front, especially when it comes to clients, because that turnaround time is so quick. If you know, trends happen and they last for five hours sometimes. So if you want to hop on that trend, you have to be quick about it. You have to be ready. You have to be engaged. And it's it's hard to keep up. It's a um, definitely not an obstacle that stops us from doing it. But it is something that is just always present there that you got to keep up. You have to be in the know and just really stay on trend because, as we all know, they change very quickly. They do. So how has leadership been a big role in your job and your career? And how would you define leadership for you? Leadership has changed in the course of my career. So um, I will tell you guys at the beginning, for a long time, there was kind of a command and control model where there would be a, a boss, a big boss who would like, tell you what to do and you would do it. There was no like discussion. There was no, um, Hey, I have an idea. There was no pushback on that. It was really hierarchical. So, you know, if the president of a company told you to do something or your manager told you to do something, check the box. It was like, okay, I'll go off and do it. Even if you disagreed with it. Um, that changed in, I would say that servant leadership became more of a, um, more of a popular leadership model, I would say in the past 10 years. And frankly, it's a healthier leadership model. Um, I think we see all different types of leaders so you still have people that are highly charismatic and kind of bossy and do that. I would submit they may not be as successful as the leaders that are not as bossy and look for feedback and want to understand the challenges and want to understand different perspectives and take counsel from the people you know, the teams that they have put together. That is a huge change in leadership. Um, the other piece that has been a huge change is showing that you're human at work, um, especially for women. Um, when I was coming up, there were very few women in senior leadership positions. And the women that were in those positions tend to play like the guys. So they were tough. They, um, they didn't necessarily help other women um, climb the ladder and a lot of them viewed younger women as a threat. Um, I think what I love about today, this present point in time is um, my generation seeks to um, bring additional women to the table and seeks to have co-mentor relationships. Katie's and my relationship, we just started working together, but our relationship started as a mentor relationship and it was a mutual mentor relationship. Um, and 
you know, I told her, I was like, I'm going to learn as much from you as, you know, you're going to learn from me because I need to understand, you know, the perspective of your generation because it's so different than the perspective of my generation. And that will help me be a better manager and a better leader. Um, and then me sharing with her kind of like old school, why we are the way we are, um, I think probably gives her a different perspective too of, oh, that makes sense as to why so-and-so reacted that way. They're not wired the same way. And maybe if I give them feedback um, in a way that they can digest it, it will help them grow. So again, I, I do think leadership style has changed. I think it's more inclusive. I think it particularly takes into account the strengths of women. Um, you know, we tend not to be as command and control as men. We tend to be uh, collaborators and looking for a solution that's going to work optimally for all involved versus um, the few. That's not to say that men don't, but, you know, again, they're wired differently um, than we are. So I think the business world has changed and has grown to appreciate the strengths of female leadership. Katie? I would say that leadership to me, Ellie, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but the kind of the concept of it's a table and your team is, we're all equal. We all have different strengths. Not one person is amazing at everything. So I think it's important especially as a leader, but I think it's important at every level in employment, starting as young as you can to look at yourself and really be self-aware and take that self-reflection and know what your strengths are and know the areas that you can find someone to help support you. So if you are really good at, um, social media, but you're not so good at the financials, you would get someone on your team who's really good at financials because then when you're together, you're ideally, you can be the best at both of those things together. And so you help each other and you win together. So that is important to me. And that's something that I really respect in leaders when they are able to see kind of areas where they need help and asking for help. I think that's another thing that has become a lot more prevalent and okay to do recently. Um, I think sometimes it's scary to ask for help or to admit that you might not know something, but it's honestly the best thing you can possibly do to have that vulnerability and to be open and honest because that's where the best learning opportunities are because you, you don't know everything. Like I probably ask 50 questions a day because I want to learn and I want to grow and I'll probably have 50 tomorrow as well, but you'll get to a point where you have less questions than when you have someone asking you those questions, it's going to feel like a little bit of a role reversal and like you're helping out your younger self. So it's very good to just focus on knowing your strengths, surrounding yourself with people who can boost you up and just remembering that it's okay to ask questions. Yeah, I love that teamwork has become more normalized and mm -hmm. it's getting bigger and it's just awesome. So yeah. is there someone that you guys looked up to in your field and why? I was lucky enough. Um, so I worked for a design agency that did a lot of work for Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble is a very large consumer packaged goods company. So they make Pantene and Olay and Tampax and Always and Herbal Essences and Old Spice. So I was lucky enough to grow up and, and work on those brands. There were a group of women that are about 10 years older than I am um, that worked at PNG and they took me under their wing. Um, and really, you know, I was traveling around the world at a relatively young age. Um, it took me under their wing, you know, talked to me about motherhood, about, um, kind of the politics of being a woman in this environment. Um, 
the industry that we're in um, is very, and to this day is still very middle-aged white male dominated. So while there are more females in the field, um, you know, when I was coming up in this industry, there were very few um, female leaders. So to have those women really take me under their wing and give me advice and care about me and have them as examples, both personally and professionally, because they were all married, they all had kids, and they all kind of showed me the ropes and, and how to balance things. Those were the people that that I looked up to because I knew, you know, that is, I wanted when I had kids, I wanted my kids to say, mom loves what she does and she loves us. And, you know, she's happy and we've got a good life because she is happy and she loves what she does. So Miss Katie. I'd say that on a personal level, the two leaders that I look up to would be my parents because they've really taught me a lot just about my interpersonal skills and things like that, how to be a good person, how to empathize with others and really focus on listening. And it's important, in my opinion, to listen, to hear and to understand what the person's saying rather than listening to just respond and have something to say back. So that was instilled in me from both of them at a very young age. And then professionally, I would say that my first um, real boss post college graduation at the um, local marketing agency here in Columbus, the media captain, um, Jason was an influential to me and my career path. Um, he really saw like my skill set in me and helped me build that confidence and helped me like navigate exactly where I wanted to go. It seemed like he cared about me growing as an individual and how can my individual growth then benefit the company secondarily to that. So first build me up as a, per as a person and then how can I help out in return? So that's something that was very important to me and I'm very grateful for that. What a great boss. I mean, I that's know. a great experience. Yeah. He was awesome. Okay, so having a mentor is great. So what advice would you give someone going into the field you're in right now? I think, so it's interesting going into our field. Um, when I was coming up, it was more, you were either client services. So you were like the relationship builder, the person that tracked the project, the person that tracked budgets, the person that really talked to the client, you were, you represented the client internally, and then you represented the agency externally to the client. Um, and then there were the creatives and they were very separate. And so creatives didn't want anything to do with budgets or timing or, you know, the complication of dealing with a lot of client conversations. I will tell you that has changed. And as I look at our industry now, I think the most successful people that I see um, deal with both sides. They're both creative and they are, are relationship and business management people. So it's not as clearly divided as it once was. You really need to have um, both skill sets. I'm not a visual creative. I've always been envious of people that could do that. I'm a writer. So that's what I bring to the table and I'm a relationship person. So that's my vein of creativity. I know that there are people here that have, they're in client services, but they have design degrees. And so they're able to contribute creatively and have a completely different discussion than I would um, simply because they have the same vernacular and education as, you know, the creatives. Conversely, the creatives are now building relationships with clients on their own. They, you know, are understanding budgets. They are dealing with political things. So again, there's sort of this merging of both mindsets and um, having both sets of muscle as you get into this industry, I think is important. Katie? 
I was just saying my biggest piece of advice would be to get ready for change um, and be okay with the fact that change is going to happen and that it's okay. I think that sometimes it's change can be viewed as scary or bad, or maybe I made a mistake and it's, it's my fault that that's happening or things like that. But with, with marketing in general, like change is going to happen maybe 30 minutes from now, maybe a day or a week from now, but it's going to happen. It's inevitable. So just be, be open to go with the flow and understand that it's just the, the market and the field that you're in. It's literally nothing personal or anything like that. So just really detaching from that. And then I would say just have fun, like marketing and communications or anything related to that field or design. There's so many different aspects to go down, like explore it, figure out what your passion is, try all of it and figure out what sticks. And you might be lucky enough to find a career that has little elements of everything that you love. So try it all. Yeah. So for my final question, what is something that you would change for the marketing industry? Something you hope to see in the future? I hope to see more female leadership. Um, I think, you know, as I said, particularly in our sector of the business, it continues to be um, very white male dominated. Um, as we look forward into, you know, the next 10, 20 years, and Katie's heard me get on my soapbox, um, the American population is changing, right? And so you guys know this um, better than my generation does, but my kids are biracial. So, you know, in 20 years, the population of this country is going to be, you know, mixed ethnicity, black, Hispanic, and Caucasians are going to be in the minority. So that being said, I think your generation is uniquely poised because you don't have a lot of the barriers um, that we did. And you guys are honest in the way you talk to each other. But I think bringing that perspective to bear to the marketing industry, like we tend, we can be a little bit myopic, truthfully. Um, you know, that's how the white beauty standard um, continues to exist in our culture. It's changing. Um, but having women from all different backgrounds that appreciate the uniqueness in each other and the unique strengths that each of you has to bring, I think would put this industry at a whole new level with different perspectives and different contributions and different processes, different ways to solve problems. So, you know, as I look into the future, I'm like, bring it ladies, like, come on in, you know, anybody who wants to get into design, branding, pre-press, digital, like knock on Katie's in my door because we want young women in this industry and we want to help them build successful careers. Katie? I would say the exact same thing. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't rephrase it any better. <laughs> there we go. Katie and Elle and Emma, that was your last question, correct? <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, Katie and Elle, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your professional and personal um, career advices um, and stories with us. We really appreciate it. And Emma, uh, you did such a fantastic job moderating the conversation. So applause all around. Thank you guys so much. Um, we did Thank you a for inviting us. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, it's an honor to have you guys here, really. Um, we didn't have any questions in the chat log. So um, that concludes our conversation for today. Um, we did record this conversation and we will post it on our YouTube page. Um, and that will be shared out on our um, Facebook page. So you can share it with your friends who maybe weren't able to attend today. Um, thank Great. you all again um, and have a, a safe and warm evening tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks.